music, teaching, and so much more. This is AD70.net. I want to welcome you to the 2010 Covenant Creation Conference here on AD70.net. Coming up, Tim Martin. Well, I want to welcome you to the 2010 Covenant Creation Conference. Uh, the first lecture starting off today, Tim Martin with Finding the Lost World of Genesis 1. How are you doing this morning, Tim? I'm doing very good, Mike. Thank you uh, for introducing everything here. And uh, can't wait to get started. This is going to be an interesting two weeks of study and presentations material. So let's get right to it. Well, on behalf of everyone involved in the developing Covenant Creation model of Genesis Creation, I want to welcome you to the second annual Covenant Creation Conference, and I want to give, right here at the top, I want to give a special thanks to Michael Loomis for producing the conference on PreteristRadio.com. Uh, this is the, actually the first fully web-based Preterist conference that I am aware of. I know there's been some some webcasts of conference material uh, from various conferences over, in the past, but this is the first fully web-based Preterist conference. And if you're wondering why, um, I just want to say up front, we had to think pretty hard about how to be the most effective with our Covenant Creation Conference f to get the most bang from our buck. And uh, I am very thankful for Michael uh, accepting our, our, our proposition to run this entire conference over the web using PreteristRadio.com. And um, I think it's going to be interesting the way it works because – what it allows us to do is it allows us to put up material that will be available around the world at any time and uh, on demand for, for people investigating the covenant creation view of Genesis. So I want to thank Michael Loomis for agreeing to produce this conference, and I hope that, uh, I hope that those who, who, who uh, download the sessions and listen to the material that we've put together will find it bit to be beneficial. And I want to say up front that um, – you know, PreteristRadio.com is a very interesting tool for preterism, and I think that uh, preterists will, as they see how this works, they will s begin to value PreteristRadio.com more and more. And it costs money to run PreteristRadio.com. Uh, it is listener-supported radio. And uh, so what I'm going to say is that if you find the Covenant Creation Conference to be helpful, I'm going to ask you to send a donation to Michael Loomis at PreteristRadio.com. To, uh, for the future uh, of Preterist Radio, you know, by doing it on, on the web, we don't have a lot of expenses. Uh, what we have is Michael Loomis doing all the work. So I think it's only fair that, um, that we say this up front to, to redirect any uh, donations that anybody feels led to give for the Covenant Creation Conference to PreteristRadio.com. And I think that will be of great help for the future. Now, who are we here gathering for this conference? Well, we are a group of preterists, mainly, who are convinced that Genesis is important to master in conjunction with Bible eschatology. And um, there's more involved this year than last year because uh, I, think, I think it's pretty safe to say that covenant creation has grown in the last year. And there are people coming into the view, studying the view, sort of investigating the view. And uh, they are now becoming participants in something that they were looking at. A while ago, and and that's a good thing. We wanted to to get the widest possible group to be involved in sort of working through the details of covenant creation, so that um, you know we can check each other's work out. We can sort of try by trial and error work through different ideas, different approaches to Genesis creation that make the most sense, especially in terms with covenant eschatology. Now, I want to re reiterate for myself right here at the beginning what. I said last conference, at the beginning of last conference, that um, I don't really feel comfortable doing some of this work. Um, some of this work is uh, leaves me a little bit baffled, and um, I just want everybody to know up front that you know I'm I'm certainly not comfortable with all the facets of covenant creation. I'm certainly not comfortable with all of the applications or the implications of covenant creation. I'm working through all this material just right alongside of everybody else. So remember that. And uh, really, I'm just uh, – I'm a guy in, in southwest Montana who has a big family, lives on a, an old Amish farm, and, and uh, I have a service business that, that uh, I make my living from, and I'm active in my 
church community here, and it's just an interest for me uh, that I have had for a long time as far as how Genesis fits in with what we call preterism or covenant eschatology. So I know there's a bunch of new people out there that are – because I meet them here on Preterist Radio. They're not familiar with the background of covenant creation. They're not familiar with sort of the the last few years of development within preterism, these uh, Genesis studies. So I want to start with a little bit of a history here because in my perspective, um, you know, I've been a preterist for about – well, I've been a preterist for a very long time, but I've been a full preterist since about 1999, 2000. That was where I made the shift even though I – I was very much aware of the view before that. But it seems to me that from about 2005 on, there was a real interest and a renaissance of Genesis studies within preterism. And since 2005, there's been sort of an explosion of covenant creation on the scene that challenges long-cherished views of Genesis among preterists. And it's controversial. I don't have to really tell anybody about this because it's pretty obvious if you're on the web, you can see the controversies going back and forth. But um, advocates of covenant creation are looking at Genesis through new glasses. And for those who want to understand the controversy, I think you really need to think of it that way. You know, when I was a kid, um, I had uh, very, very bad eyesight. I was very, very nearsighted. And so um, when I was uh, in... I don't know, I might have been six or seven years old. I remember the day specifically where I could not see anything around me. Everything was fuzzy other than right up by my nose. And nobody knew it. You know, nobody knew it. I was homeschooled at the time, so I didn't really have a a classroom scene where teachers can kind of pick out that people can't read the chalkboard or whatever. My parents didn't really notice it, but I was blind. I was virtually blind. And I remember the day when something clicked And my parents took me to the eye doctor. And I remember the day when I was looking through his glasses, the little things that you do the, you know, the test with. And I could see. It was unbelievable. And then I got my first pair of glasses, real thick glasses, when I was like seven years old. And I put them on and I walked outside. And it was like I just walked into a new world. Everything was crystal clear. I could see the leaves on the tree. I could see everything. I could see distance. I could see people's faces clearly. Everything was different. And I remember that day like it was yesterday because it was such a traumatic experience, such a, just, just an unforgettable experience of putting on glasses to be able to see something for the very first time. Well, that's a lot like covenant creation because covenant creation, what it really is, is a new context of viewing Genesis creation. We apply the same covenant context that we are convinced exists with eschatology, what we call covenant eschatology or preterism, not just to the end of the Bible, but also to the beginning. And so preterism changes from a material universe definition as a topic of Bible prophecy to a covenant definition. So the passing away of the old heavens and the old earth of biblical prophecy is the final end of the old covenant order has nothing to do with the end of the physical universe, right? That's how we look at covenant eschatology or preterism. Well, covenant creation is the same view applied to Genesis. Covenant creation takes the Genesis creation from a material universe definition as a topic of Genesis related to scientific concerns, modern debates about the age of the universe, evolution, and material concerns as as where did all of this material stuff come from? Those are the concerns of the traditional view of creation to a different context, to a covenant context. So we would say that this is now the inauguration of the old covenant order, which came to a complete and final end in the first century. And so covenant creation matches up well with covenant eschatology. And I'll give you an example of this. I just got a magazine in the mail this week from Answers in Genesis. And Answers in Genesis is one of the preeminent organizations pushing you know what was what is known as young earth creationism, but really ultimately it's about uh, uh, defending the material view of creation. And let me just show you how this works. Okay, they have this little magazine put out called Answers and um, Answers Update. And in this issue, it talks about the Creation Museum update, and it gives a whole bunch of list of things that you're supposed to learn if you go through the Creation Museum. And number five on the list, it says, "Why do we have to wear clothes?" 
Okay, so and then I go to the answer. I'm sort of curious about this. So I read the answer. It says, before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. But after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were ashamed of their nakedness and covered themselves. Sin brought shame and a need to be covered. Now, they're using the creation account in regards to physical things. That's just one element of it. They use that as the explanation for why we physically wear clothes that is a physical universe or a material view of creation applied and they do they do it with so many other different things like thorns and thistles you know the curse on the ground they talk talk about the physical earth being cursed that's all a function every one of those details is a function of their material universe view of creation covenant creation looks at that very differently so as a covenant creationist i would say i would say when they ask that question about being clothed they've missed the point of the whole story of genesis creation with in regards to clothing and so a covenant creation approach to that would ask the question where else in the scriptures do we find this issue of clothing being important within a covenant context and of course lo and behold the new testament is full of the idea of being clothed with the old covenant and then not being found naked in God's sight in terms of judgment and then the putting on of the immortal body the new covenant life in Christ so that's the difference it's a covenant context to these stories and I think uh, covenant creation would argue that we should read those first and I look forward very much to Alan Bondar's presentation later this evening which will deal with that particular subject in detail now why is this issue of Genesis creation important because if it causes a great deal of consternation among preterists, then should we really even be discussing this issue of Genesis if it's so controversial? Well, it causes consternation among preterists. A lot of preterists are very, very, um, shall we say, threatened. They feel threatened by any sort of reexamination of Genesis in terms of what they believe to be Genesis, uh, the story of Genesis and what Genesis is all, is all about. So... What I've found in my experience, and I'm not saying this across the board, I'm saying this is a general pattern, is that there are a lot of preterists who are invested in a physical material view of Genesis creation as the physical universe. And it's been an expensive debate because when we start talking about Genesis, you start talking about people that have been involved in the anti-evolution debate. You've been talking about people who have been involved in a young earth creationist debate and an old earth creationist debate. We sometimes don't realize that both of those views are very old views in some respects in the last hundred years, and they've been they've created generated a lot of controversy that people have paid a high price for. And anytime that you're invested in something, uh, when somebody comes along and says, you know, maybe that wasn't the right way to handle it, it becomes a little bit unnerving. And we can see the same thing with with preterism. Uh, the fu- transition between from futurism to preterism uh, will generate some of the same angst that we see in this in this covenant creation debate as well. So I've heard from preterists who insist that they are just going to ignore this debate over Genesis outright. And they just have no interest whatsoever in Genesis studies. And I've heard from preterists who are angry about, you know, covenant creation, this developing view in preterism that, uh, you know, they feel threatened by. And uh, I think you'll see it's a weird resemblance to the way futurists respond to preterism When it's pointed out that their futurist views of prophecy have no biblical basis, right? People just ignore it. They just start ignoring preterists as if if they have no interest in it whatsoever. Or they get angry with preterists for pointing it out. So it's um, dogmatic futurists ignore preterism, and they get angry with preterism. And to those who are objectively evaluating covenant creation, I think it is interesting for you guys to to look at how these issues are being presented and how the response – is being formulated. Um, but really the question is, why is it worth the trouble? Why is it worth the trouble for us to investigate covenant creation and cause this great big argument, this great big debate within the confines of covenant eschatology? Well, I believe it is worth the trouble because all eschatology begins in Genesis. We already understand that in regard to the death of Adam. Preterists must show that the death of the Adam in the garden the death in the garden is purely covenantal. That is, it is a break in the ordained relationship between God the Father and Adam the Son. Physical death is not in view in the story. 
And predators are already arguing this. They already understand that it's very important to get that part right and not start with a wrong definition of the death in the garden. Because if you start smuggling in physical death into the story of the garden, predators already understand what happens. All of preterism falls apart because we still have physical death in our world today. And if Christ came to redeem us from the curse that fell on Adam and the creation, then that part of the curse has to be overcome. And that's what automatically leads futurists because they start with a physical material view of the death in the garden. That's what leads them directly to futurism and their view of a physical material resurrection of physical bodies so, uh, to come so-called at the end of the physical universe. So we already understand this as preterists, that the death in the garden is important to understand. Therefore, Genesis is important to understand. Eschatology begins in Genesis. Now, would it make sense to you that the death in the garden is very important to understand, but nothing else in Genesis is very important to understand as a preterist? I don't think that makes sense because you can't separate the death in the story and the nature of the death in the story from the nature of the creation. Paul certainly doesn't. When Romans 8 starts talking about the creation being in bondage, he's putting those things together. So we can't divorce the death in Genesis, the original death, the first mention of the death from the nature of creation and really make much sense because it just becomes arbitrary. We become sort of inconsistent. And I think it's important to get to master the entire context of Genesis, what all of Genesis is all about, to complement covenant eschatology. So this fact makes Genesis creation important for preterists. It is not enough to say the nature of the death in the garden is important to get right and then remain aloof from the nature of creation. The nature of creation and the nature of the curse are related. And I think you can see that through the prophets. You can see that in the New Testament. Paul, obviously, nor any of the other New Testament writers divorces the nature of the death from the nature of the creation. So, it is really the material view of creation in Genesis which is the great obstacle to preterism. People who get stuck on the physical universe as the creation are not going to suddenly embrace a covenant context for the new creation in Bible prophecy. And I think if you've talked to futurists, if you start asking these kinds of questions, where are they getting their insistence that, say, the prophecies of the new heavens and new earth must be a new physical universe, I think you'll see that where that's really rooted is not so much in their view of the prophets, but it's rooted in their view of the original creation. They're going to look for a new physical universe when they read texts which use Genesis 1 language in reference to the new creation. And that's, of course, going to lead them directly to futurism. And so my conclusion in this whole debate is that preterism is sunk as long as a material view of creation holds absolute dominance among Christians. And I want to go through a few biblical texts here to show how the prophets used creation. And none of these are new. These are just the the sort of scratching the surface as far as the way the Bible uses creation text in terms of covenant, in terms of uh, covenant relationship between God and his people. And I want to start with Isaiah 65 17. This is a very famous passage that preterists are very familiar with. Isaiah 65, verse 17 says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. Now, that language I will create new heavens and a new earth is the exact same language, although future from the prophet's perspective, as Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when you look at this language of new creation, we as preterists know what this is. But I want to know if, if we preterists understand where Isaiah the prophet is getting this language because we make the argument that John in Revelation 21 and elsewhere is not changing the definition of what the prophets were teaching. 
John isn't changing the definition of the new heavens and new earth that Isaiah works from. We make the argument that uh, John is working in context of the law and the prophets, just like Jesus, just like Paul, etc. So the next question becomes, well, what what is Isaiah the prophet working in terms of? Is he redefining this language in a whole new way from Genesis 1-1? I don't believe he is. In fact, if I say... If, if I go to those who object to covenant creation and I say, look, he's using the exact same language from Genesis 1-1, how is it that he is now changing the meaning of the, a new heavens, a new earth from a material view of the physical universe to a covenant context? How is it that, that Isaiah the prophet can change that meaning and yet we argue that John can't change Isaiah's meaning? See, it doesn't work. If you're going to argue that this is a common thread using the same language to refer to similar and related concepts, you've got to stay consistent. And so that's that's a first example from Isaiah 65. Next is uh, next one I want to look at, and this is one of those that um, is really blatantly obvious, is Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. And again, notice how in the context here, the prophet is talking about God's people. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Once again, this is blatant creation imagery drawn directly from Genesis 1. In fact, the whole order here matches up with the the order of creation in Genesis chapter 1. So how is the prophet using this in the covenant context? He's using it in covenant context with the the uh, coming judgment of God on Israel in 586 BC, and that and that state of the covenant world at that period of time was like the Genesis one creation. In fact, it's sort of like it reverts back to that state of chaos and darkness and uh, emptiness, formless and empty. The heavens and their light were, was gone. You know, the mountains were not established. They were shaking and swaying. And I looked and there were no people. In fact, that's the whole point of the creation account. The creation account goes, works its way through this, this, this succession to bring about people who live in the land. Of course, I would say in a covenant context, that's referring to people living in covenant with God. That's what creation is all about. But here is Jeremiah using all of this very same language from Genesis chapter 1 in regards to God's people and the state of the covenant world. How can he do that if Genesis 1 is intended to be understood as the physical universe? Are we going to are we going to say that the physical universe came undone in Jeremiah chapter 4 in reference to 586 BC? Well, it depends on what universe you're talking about, right? If you're talking about the covenant universe, yes. Yes, and I I, I gave a presentation last year at the Covenant Creation Conference regarding the promised land of Lot. And it was not just Israel that was being carried into captivity in 586 BC, but it was a lot of other nations that had a history of the knowledge of God. So the whole covenant creation was was undone at this period of time, and Nebuchadnezzar became God's tool in which to bring about judgment, not just on Israel, but on other nations as well. So I would... I would say, you know, I would ask very clearly, why is Jeremiah using this language if Genesis 1 is, must be understood in terms of a material view in regards to the physical universe? So think about that as well. Now, these passages have been bounced around uh, a number of times. Let's go to the next one now in Matthew 24. This is probably somewhat more familiar to Preterists because we're so familiar with the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Notice the language again there, coming drawn from Genesis chapter 1. And it's easy to say that this is referring to Israel alone, but 
the context won't allow that because Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, Jesus puts the same coming judgment, the same passing way of the heavens and earth in the context that goes all the way back to the earliest chapters of Genesis. Verse 35 of Matthew 23, and so upon you, that would be the first century uh, Jews, will come on, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. All of this blood guilt for all of covenant history, going back to Abel, is going to come on that generation. You see how, see how Jesus is working from the full context of the Old Testament? He's drawing this co- great covenant judgment, this consummation of the old heavens and earth, all the way back to the earliest chapters of Genesis. So when we see this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I think we need to think in terms of the context here, all the way back to the earliest chapters of Genesis. Next is another one of those blatant verse, uh, blatant passages, which has been getting a lot of attention recently. Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. And this is sort of the introduction to the, to the letter of Hebrews. The writer says, he also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. And so the idea here is, quoting from Psalm 102, which is a psalm about God's people, Here you have the writer of Hebrews saying, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's referring to Genesis creation in the beginning language. And he associates that earth and heavens that God made in the beginning as going to perish. And it's not just going to perish, it's going to change from one world to the next. And This is one of those texts that I saw many years ago, but I never saw it. If you know what I mean? I was blind to what the writer of Hebrews was saying. And this context of Hebrews, going back to Genesis, is not just listed here. If you go to Hebrews 11, you'll see that it's it's very much along the same lines. Hebrews 11 talks about the creation of what God made in the beginning, and then it gives the hall of faith. And this is written to Hebrews. This is the writer of Hebrews recording Hebrew history. In Hebrews chapter 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. What's the covenant context here? Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. They had the hope of the new covenant resurrection life. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe interesting translation in the NIV, that the universe was formed at God's command so what that what is seen is not made out of what was visible. Now, in the Greek, it's not the universe singular in that passage. It's age plural. Ages were formed at God's command. But it's so obvious, and I want to make the point here in various translations, it's so obvious that the writer of Hebrews is talking about Genesis creation that they just insert universe there because that's the only thing that they can think of in terms of their paradigm. They can only see the physical universe, but that's not what the, that's not what the Greek says. And then immediately in verse 4, Hebrews 11 begins with the history of the Hebrews. Again, we're writing to Hebrews with Abel. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. And, and so the history right there of the Hebrews goes back to Abel. We're talking about the whole Old Covenant history here in terms of being folded up, what God made uh, as far as something being seen, something being a representation of God's covenant relationship, all of the sacrifices, all of the Old Covenant order, all of the regulations, the seasons, the years, the Sabbath days, the whole work was being changed into that which was not seen. So that is another aspect of Hebrews. And and. Again, when I first began studying this stuff 
And uh, I wrote the first little booklet on Noah's flood back in 2001. I had a guy come up and, to, and, and bring up Hebrews 1, 10, and 10 through 12. And I just rebelled against the idea that Hebrews actually says what Hebrews says. <laughs> it was like, I don't want that. No, no, that's not, that, can't be, that can't be true. Genesis 1, 1 is about the physical universe. And that's how I dismissed it. It was like I could not get to the point of seeing what the writer of Hebrews was saying. And that's how, that's how pervasive that physical universe mindset is among us. In fact, you know, I ran across another example of this in a book that I read uh, very early on when I became a full preterist. This is um, John Noe's book, Beyond the End Times. The Rest of the Greatest Story Ever Told, published in 1999. This was a big book back when I became a first, first became a full preterist. This was, was very, very popular within full preterist circles. And I just want to show you another example of how, how, how blind we are as preterists by being so focused on the end and prophecy at the biblical connection that the writers of Scripture make all the way back to Genesis creation. Um, this is on page 235 of Beyond the End Times, and I want to just just uh, read this here from John Noe's book back in 1999. It just shows how easy it was for all of us preterists who are just coming into preterism to understand the full scope of what covenant eschatology is all about. Um, John writes, the importance of this change of covenant worlds also can be seen in the inspired words of the writer of Hebrews. In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. And then John quotes from Hebrews 8.13, showing the pattern there. Uh, parallel to covenant worlds, he says, by calling this covenant, or this is Hebrews 8.13, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Now, listen to the commentary that John Noe gives regarding Hebrews 1, 10, and 12 in context with Hebrews 8.13. He says, if God destroyed the old covenant, heaven and earth, the world of biblical Judaism, would he not establish a new one to replace the old? Or would he leave a multi-century void? As we shall see, the old heavens and earth which God had planted, prefigured, and linked directly into the new. The old indeed perished and was changed, but the transition and transformation from one covenant world to the other would occur through a shaking process. To which I say, Amen. He is seeing this entirely in terms of covenant worlds, from one covenant world to the next. But what's he missing? The writer of Hebrews is going back to in the beginning. And that takes us right back to Genesis 1.1. Just like the book of John opens with in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Nobody debates that what's being referred to there. John is basically making an allusion back to Genesis 1.1. And I believe that John 1.1 1, 1, and Hebrews 1 are doing the same thing because that's how they open their presentations, though they are different, slightly different in their context and their audiences that they're, they're aimed at, they do the very same thing from the very openings and introductions of their books. So that's how blind we were as preterists, because we were so focused, we were so focused on the end, we were so focused on eschatology, that Genesis just wasn't in our field of view. Genesis was just sort of there. And you know, some of some preterists that over the years have said, you know, Genesis baffles me. I am not sure what's going on in Genesis. I just find it odd that you have, you know, these patriarchs living hundreds of years. I find the whole story odd, the way you have different creation accounts ordered differently. And they're baffled by it. And I think that's a good sign because um, – Although it tends to cause preterists not to want to study Genesis, it's a good sign that, they, that all is not well with our view of Genesis. So let's move on, of course, to Revelation 20, Revelation 21. And the whole passage, Revelation 20 through 22, is universally recognized as drawing on the structure and the content 
and the detail that are first unveiled to us in the very first chapters of, of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 3. But in Revelation 21, I think this is really one of the, one of the uh, most obvious examples of the way covenant creation works. John writes in Revelation 21, 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. John is working from the threefold structure of Genesis creation and Genesis 1, where God originally created the heavens and the earth and the sea. And we can see this elsewhere in Revelation, back in 20 even. There's, a, there's this great judgment where the sea gives up its dead and you know, heaven and earth flees from the presence of God and the judgment of the dead takes place based on what is recorded in the books. So again, we find John working from Genesis chapter 1. How can he do that? How can he do that referring to uh, the structure and content of the first creation, beginning in Genesis 1, 1, and yet not be talking about the physical material universe? I maintain it's because they're all on the same page. John is doing that because he understands what the original creation was all about. It is in covenant context. And that's how you can go from one covenant world, the old covenant world, to the new covenant world of Christ. It's all about covenant from Genesis to Revelation. I don't think that really sounds that strange. You know, after you become a preterist for a while and you say, it's sh- well, that's covenantal. Shouldn't it make sense that the beginning is covenantal as well? And here's what I'm most excited about, and I want to um, throw this idea out to you that uh, it's not just preterists who are starting to see this. There are people working within Genesis studies who are not full preterists, who are now understanding that there's something going on in Genesis 1 that is not like what we've been led to believe for the last hundreds of years. And I want to start with Milton Terry because I think covenant creation, uh, covenant creation is really a result of a lot of Milton Terry's work. And if you read Biblical Apocalyptics, it's, it's kind of funny because Biblical Apocalypse, Apocalyptics, that famous book that preterists point to all the time, starts in Genesis. And then it gets to New Testament prophecy. But a lot of preterists never read the first part of Milton Terry's book. I was on the phone with a preterist one time, and um, he had actually published books referencing Milton Terry. And uh, he just used Milton Terry for the, for the hermeneutic approach that we now recognize uh, that, is, that is utilized by preterism. Milton Terry was you know, sort of the, uh, one of the leaders in, in developing and, and systematizing the grammatical historical approach. And uh, I asked him, well, what do you think about Milton Terry's view of Genesis creation? He says, I don't have no idea what it was. And, and I about lost it because here's a preterist who's in print, quoting from Milton Terry all over the place in regards to prophecy, but he had no idea what Terry taught about Genesis creation. And what Terry did was he, he brought Genesis creation more toward a covenant context rather than sort of a literal, physical, scientific definition of, of the physical universe. Terry said this on page 44 of Biblical Biblical Apocalyptics. He says, speaking of Genesis, it is as truly a sevenfold revelation of a beginning as the apocalypse is a mystic revelation of an end. And so what was Milton Terry doing with Biblical Apocalyptics? He was working on the whole Bible and its relationship to itself. And he was bringing more and more of a covenant context to the way people looked at Genesis creation. Of course, for Milton Terry, that meant a lot of symbolism. That meant a lot of, uh, of, of uh, covenant language, a lot of uh, things that more match up with the book of Revelation. And uh, if you think about Milton Terry's view, it's sort of like an updated view of Augustine's take on creation because Augustine had a little bit different sort of non-literal but kind of literal view of creation. Milton Terry is a lot like that. Milton Terry of course, was still a futurist too because he viewed the millennium as the entire church age, which left an end to come 
uh, within biblical con- biblical history that we are still awaiting. So Milton Terry had this futurist view of the physical universe at the end of the millennium. Everything would be wrapped up. History would be wrapped up, and we would have a physical end to the physical universe. So Milton Terry, even though he went a long ways to helping uh, people come to uh, covenant eschatology, and he still has remarkable work in his in his book books that were written in the late 1800s, he was still a futurist and he still saw a physical universe in the end. And so he was still trying to keep a material view of creation going in Genesis. So there was a little distortion there. But Milton Terry was way, way, way ahead of the game back in the late 1800s. Now, more recently, John Salehammer, and I would recommend his books, either uh, Genesis Unbound, which is actually very hard to get right now, or the the Pentateuch as narrative. Uh, in the early 19, 19s, uh, 1990s, John Salehammer wrote a book that was very controversial at the time, and he made the argument that the context of creation, Genesis chapter 1, except for the very first verse, is Israel. And you see a development there? Salehammer's arguing that the garden is connected to the promised land. In fact, he argued that they're identical. And so all the story of the garden is really the story of Israel. You know, God taking Israel from outside and putting Israel in the promised land and promising that if they break the covenant, they'll be kicked out. Just like the story of Adam. Adam made in the wilderness, taken into the garden, and given a command not to transgress. And then when he transgresses the command, he's kicked out. It's the story of Israel. And that's a major, major development. Now, he was thinking in terms of local creation – He's not thinking in terms of covenant creation, but it is progress, and that's the way progress works. It works a little bit at a time by people who are not even preterists. Salehammer is a dispensationalist, and yet he's starting to see Genesis creation in terms of covenant context. This is progress. And another one is uh, G.K. Beale, and I don't, I don't really want to spend a lot of time with G.K. Beale. He's got some very interesting stuff regarding the temple imagery in Genesis 1 through 3. And uh, that's very important because if you start talking about temple imagery, we're not talking about physical universe anymore. Temple imagery is d- designed for a covenant purpose, right? That's, what, that's where God lives with his people in the temple. And it's just fantastic how this continues to develop by other writers who are not even considered full preterists. They start seeing the covenant connection. Another one is James Jordan, and, and uh, people get upset because I use James Jordan stuff. He is a, young, a self-professed young earth creationist. But James Jordan argues that Adam is a priest. Adam in the garden is God's first priest. Does that give you a little bit different conception of what Adam is all about? I mean, priests represent others to God, right? They represent others to God and go, act as a go-between between men and God. That, that changes that view of Genesis creation from the very bare, literal, you know, just the facts, ma'am, type of description of the beginning of the physical universe. Now, in the last year, and this is, this astonished me, in the last year, there have been major, major articles and major books written that have just blown me away because things are getting closer and closer and closer to covenant creation. Not just by us crazy guys here, you know, full preterist, heretic squared, heretics on both ends of the Bible type of guys. These are people out there who are starting to write things about covenant creation. Um, I'll give you one example. And this, this article is actually linked on our website in the related articles and recordings section. This article is by Brian Gadawa, and the title is Biblical Creation and Storytelling, Cosmogony, Combat, and Covenant. And Brian is actually a filmmaker who lives in Los Angeles, and he's the author of Hollywood Worldviews, Watching Films with Wisdom and Discernment and Word Pictures, Knowing God Through Story and Imagination. This is, this is an artist. He is, he is working in the culture uh, as far as applying his Christian worldview to the to the, the aspect of movie making. In fact, Brian was invited to the 2007 Worldview Conference at American Vision by Gary DeMar. And this is this is this is where Brian has gone. And I think this is a very p- 
powerful statement. This is a recent article from earlier this year. You can read the full article. A link to the, uh, the link to the article is on our website. You can read the full article there. Find the link there and go read the whole thing. But I want to just read a couple of sections. Brian writes, the creation of the covenant is the creation of the heavens and earth. <laughs> one statement. And he's talking about Genesis 1. He says, the covenant is a cosmos, not a material one centered in astronomical location and abstract impersonal forces as modern worldview demands, but a theological one centered in the sacred space of land, temple, and cult as ancient Near Eastern worldview demands. And he goes on to say later in his article, this covenant as creation word picture is reiterated in a negative way when God judges the nations and cultures. If creation of covenant involved establishing the foundations of the heavens and the earth, then covenantal judgment involves decreation imagery or of the destruction or shaking of heavens and earth. Haggai conveys this decreation polemic against the nations. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and earth. I will overthrow the th thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. Jeremiah calls the destruction of Jerusalem, 587, 587 B.C., a return of the heavens and earth to the formless and void of Genesis 1-2, without man or beast yet created. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void into the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness. Isaiah proclaims the good news of a new covenant in Messiah, Isaiah 61, as a new heavens and new earth, Isaiah 65. Covenant is understood as creation of a heaven and earth. So important covenantal events such as judgment on a people or creation of a new covenant are understood as shaking that heaven and earth or a return to a pre-creation state of the universe. Of course, he's talking about the universe of Genesis 1.1. I mean, that's remarkable. Here's a guy uh, just writing this pers artistic perspective of how the ancient Near East worldview is different than our modern physical material universe view of everything. We, we view as creation as something that is material. We view existence in terms of that which is material. And he's looking at this and saying, no, no, they didn't have that view at all. They had a different view, and it was in terms of covenant. So everything uh, is covenantal here. That's really what Brian Godawa is saying, and I encourage you to, to read that article for yourself and, and gain some insights there because it's really a fantastic article. Now, the next one that has come to my attention in the last year, and this is something I think we'll be talking about quite a bit at this conference and probably in the future, is a brand new book by John H. Walton. He, this is called The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate. And I got home from last year's Covenant Creation Conference because this book came out last year late in the summer. And uh, about two weeks after I got home, I've read a little bit of John Walton's book uh, material before, and I've even used some of his uh, material last year, last year's conference regarding what the what the nature of creation is, what Bera means. I used all of that, but I got home and I got an email from from a well-known preterist who says, Tim, have you seen this book? Of course, it wasn't out yet. This is the guy, this is a guy who gets pre-publication specials and abstracts and everything. Uh, he stays very much up to date on the, uh, on the current publishing scene and, and pays real close attention to different books that are coming out. He says, have you seen this book yet? And I said, no, I've never seen that book. He says, you should order it. I'm like, okay. Well, it was like a month from being published. So I went to Amazon.com and I ordered the book, not thinking much about it. But then it came in the mail. And, you know, John H. Walton is professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Wheaton College is a very important institution within, you know, conservative evangelical Christianity. Wheaton College is where the leaders go 
the leaders of evangelicalism, a lot of them are coming from Wheaton College. And here's a guy teaching Old Testament at Wheaton College, a Hebrew scholar, and he starts writing this book about the lost world of Genesis 1. That's where I got the title from my, from my presentation here because I think the key is finding the lost world of Genesis 1. But I just want to read a few selections here from this book called The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate by John H. Walton. If, if you're interested in covenant creation, you need to get this book because it's just just amazing amazing what john walton has done from page 17 john walton begins with the context of genesis he says if we accept genesis 1 as ancient cosmology then we need to interpret it as ancient cosmology rather than translate it into modern cosmology if we try to turn it into modern cosmology we are making the text say something that it never said now there's some principles there that preterists should find very important, right? Audience relevance, original audience context. What is the original mindset of the original audience? That's what he's getting at. And we could say the same thing about eschatology, right? If you take eschatology and rip it out of the ancient mindset from which they worked and give it a new definition, you are making the text say something about Bible prophecy that it never said. So he goes on to say, Later on page 17, we gain nothing by bringing God's revelation in accordance with today's science. Does that sound familiar? Covenant creationists are arguing that. It's not about science. It doesn't matter old earth science. It doesn't matter young earth science. It doesn't matter old creationist views of gap theory. It just it has nothing to do with science. Next in, in Walton's book on page 24 and 25, we find this. In a discussion of origins, we need to focus on the ontology of the cosmos. What does it mean for the world or the cosmos or the objects in it to exist? How should we think about cosmic ontology? When we speak of cosmic ontology these days, it can be seen that our culture views existence and therefore meaning in material terms. Our material view of ontology in turn determines how we think about creation and it is easy to see how. He's saying that we are predisposed, we are hardwired in our modern culture to think of origins in terms of the material universe. And that is exactly the problem we have with preterism, is it not? We are running into that over and over again because people are predisposed to think of eschatology not in terms of covenant context, but in terms of the physical material context. Our culture has given us our belief, beliefs about what it means for the cosmos to exist. Material ontology, existence is material, creation is a material act. And many of us would not realize that these beliefs are the result of a choice. It is a testimony to the pervasive influence of culture that this material ontology seems so obvious as to prevent any thought that it is open to discussion. That's what we're doing with covenant creation. We are opening that discussion. Now, this is where it gets real interesting with Walton. He gives this explanation in his second chapter. In this book, I propose that people in the ancient world believed that something existed not by virtue of its material properties, but by virtue of its having a function in an ordered system. Here I do not refer to an ordered system in scientific terms, but an ordered system in human terms, that is, in relation to society and culture. In this sort of functional ontology, the sun does not exist by virtue of its material properties, or even by its function as a burning ball of gas. Rather, it exists by virtue of the role that it has in its sphere of existence, particularly in the way that it functions for humankind and human society. In theory, this way of thinking could result in something being included in the existent category in a material way, but still be considered in the non-existent category in functional terms. In a functional ontology, to bring something into existence would require giving it a function or a role in an ordered system rather than giving it material properties. Consequently, something could be manufactured physically but still not exist if it has not become functional. Let's 
reverse that now for, for preterism on the other end of the Bible. Something could still exist physically and come to an end covenantally, like the sun, moon, and stars, that which God created in the beginning. Do you see how this works on both ends of the Bible? Now, John Walton is not a preterist, but he is setting the stage, helping people find a lost world in Genesis 1 that is going to take people right into full preterism because that's what full preterism is all about. Full preterism is eschatology that has nothing to do with the context of a material universe. It is a covenant context to eschatology. Next, in ver- page 35, Jotten Walton has this to say. Consequently, to create something, that is, cause it to exist, in the ancient world means to give it a function, not material properties. We need to note the contrast. We tend to think of the cosmos as a machine and argue whether someone is running the machine or not. The ancient world viewed the cosmos more like a company or a kingdom. The old kingdom. That's what the old creation is all about. The old, and he's trying to modernize this to help people understand what he's saying when, with his focus on the functional aspect of creation, like a company or a kingdom. Now, page 45. Speaking of the word beginning in Hebrew, he says, in Hebrew usage, This adverb typically introduces a period of time rather than a point in time. And he gives a citation there from John Sailhammer. And I believe I used that citation last year at the Covenant Creation Conference because Sailhammer shows from an analysis of the Hebrew word beginning that it talks about the beginning of a certain time, not the beginning of the physical universe. So just like preterists talk about the end of the age, well, the beginning is the beginning of that context. And this is something that the Hebrew scholars now are pointing out, and it's very, very helpful for us to understand the beginning in covenant context. Next, we have page 57. And this might sound familiar to you. He says that if this, that's Genesis 1, is not an account of material origins then Genesis 1 is affirming nothing about the material world. See, you thought it was just a bunch of crazy preterists talking about covenant creation, not talking about the physical universe. Here's a professor of Old Testament, Wheaton College, making this kind of statement. Brand new book put out late summer last year, coming to the very same conclusions. And then he has an entire chapter he has an entire chapter beginning in verse, uh, chapter, or page 93. Chapter 9, he says, The seven days of Genesis 1 relate to the cosmic temple inauguration. And this is where there is a little bit of difference between covenant creation and what John Walton is talking about because he's viewing the physical universe as the cosmic temple where God comes and sets up his throne and lives with his people. But do you get the idea from the New Testament the new heavens and new earth, that God is setting up a new temple in terms of a new physical universe. So there is a difference here, and you'll have to, you'll have to watch this. I'm not saying that he's in 100% agreement with, with the direction of the specific details of covenant creation. I'm saying he is coming a long ways, and he's taking a lot of people with him. And that should be something that you find very exciting, especially if you advocate covenant creation, because it's not just a bunch of loony full preterist anymore. This is where, this is the trajectory. This is the trajectory of Genesis studies. You know, we're not going back. I hope you understand this from this, from these various details that I'm presenting here. We're not going back to just the facts, ma'am, kind of conclusions regarding Genesis. Once you go this direction, it's not going to be just a bare, literal, scientific record of the origins of the physical universe. That's done. These scholars are taking it far beyond that, and they're going in a a direction, a trajectory that's going to lead them to rethinking everything about futurism on the other side of the Bible, because creation and new creation are connected. I love his chapter 10. I'll just leave it. Well, the title of 
chapter 10 is the seven days of Genesis 1 do not concern material origins. I think that sounds familiar from a covenant creation point of view. He says, one of the most common questions about this view comes from those who are struggling with a worldview shift. And that's what this is. This is a worldview shift. Just like preterism is a worldview shift on the other end of the Bible. One of the most common questions about this view comes from those who are struggling with a worldview shift from material orientation to functional orientation. A difficult jump for all of us. In a last effort to cling to a material perspective, they ask, why can't it be both? It is easy to see the functional orientation of the account, but does the material aspect have to be eliminated altogether? This is where John Walton is dealing with some critics, and I think that his response is very helpful uh, for those in the covenant creation view and how they deal with critics as well. But listen to what he has to say in answer to his, to his own hypothetical question. He says, in answer to this question, if we say that the text includes a material element alongside the functional, this view has to be demonstrated, not just retained, because it is the perspective most familiar to us. The comfort of our traditional worldview is an insufficient basis for such a conclusion. We must be led by the text. A material interest cannot be assumed by default. It must be demonstrated, and we must ask ourselves why we are so interested in seeing the count in material terms. And he goes on to give examples why it must be functional and why it cannot be sort of a both-and approach. So I want to recommend The Lost World of Genesis 1 to everyone who's interested in studying the covenant creation view. It's well worth your money, and you're going to see that uh, there is a lot of progress in Genesis studies, and I think it'll be self-explanatory about the direction of where that progress is going. What is going to happen when Christians find the lost world of Genesis 1? When Christians see that the lost world of Genesis 1 is the old covenant world, then they will be easily led to the doorstep of the preterist view of Bible prophecy. Finding the lost world of Genesis 1 is a major step in finding the covenant context of the new covenant creation, the new heavens and earth, as completely fulfilled in the work of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here today with this conference. Let the studies begin. Our goal is going to be to firm up and investigate the covenant creation model a little bit more. Some of the sessions may seem a little bit technical or abstract to you, but this is foundational work that will provide a base for more practical applications to come down the road. And I envision the future of covenant creation will be one of a gradual transition from uh, what we would think of as a formal argument or academic subject to a complementary paradigm that perfectly matches covenant eschatology. A covenant approach to all of Scripture will have many applications, and we already understand that in regard to eschatology. Your world looks different now that you are a full preterist than before you became a full preterist. My world is entirely different. I look at everything differently in terms of covenant eschatology, what my purpose here on life is, what my goals in life are, why I'm working on the things that I'm working. You know, the difference between living in God's garden and just, you know, passing through, waiting for, you know, the final arrival in the promised land is huge. And it's no less true in regard to the creation itself. So I want to throw out, you know, we may get pretty technical the different presenters may get a little technical and academic, but I want you to think a little bit about the future here. Those of you who are investigating and, and, and those who end up embracing covenant creation through your own studies, there's going to be a lot of practical stuff that are, is going to be covered in the future. And I think there's going to take some time once we lay the found foundations, when we get a paradigm, sort of an outline or a basic structure to what covenant creation is all about, where people can do their do more study in terms of the application and more in terms of the the uh, practical relevance. So I'll throw out, and I hope we get there fast because I think that's more important than what we're doing today. I think it's very interesting what we're doing today, but and it's necessary. You always have to do the theoretical work first, particularly ex exegetically from the scriptures themselves and build 
on that foundation of God's word. But there is going to come a point in time, and I'm looking forward to it, when covenant creation starts becoming very, very practical. And hopefully next year, I've talked a little bit with Jeff about this, hopefully next year we can do some more things that would be recognized as practical things. So I've got some topic session titles here, totally imaginary. We're not going to be doing these session titles this year. But these are just things that popped into my mind that I think covenant creation would sort of take things in a new direction and fix a lot of problems, solve some issues within the church that have been bothering people for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and that are very relevant to today. So I'm going to throw these topics out. Again, they're imaginary. Nobody's going to be talking on these topics. But I think if you just mull over the titles a little bit, you'll see how covenant creation plays into it. The first one is Rethinking Congregational Life, Covenant Fellowship with God Through His People. We've got to rethink the whole concept of church. I think from a preterist perspective, but also from a creation perspective. What are we created for? We are created for fellowship with God. How does that take place? We are created for fellowship with God through his people. Because it's through God's people that we have fellowship with God. That's the way the scriptures present it in the New Testament. So this idea of an institutional church that sort of is, you know, faceless, nameless, and generic. I think when you when you really get into the covenant context, both beginning and end has got to end. I mean, really, how are you going to do church like you've always done church as a futurist when you've gone through a major transformation in eschatology? Because churches now, what are they there for? They present themselves there for, you know, stopping Satan and the devil and helping you get from this life to the next because that's the way they present the gospel. In fact, if you go to Lutheran church, I I actually live um, just a little ways from Butte, Montana. And Butte, Montana has a very, very old history with a mining history here. And um, in fact, Butte, Montana was the third, I believe it was the third city in America to have electrical power back early, early in the 1900s. And the reason they did that is to run the mines because the mines were, were extremely lucrative to run. But uh, copper and silver and gold and things like that. But over in Butte, they have this old town Butte part of, t- of, this, of the city where all the old architecture things exist. And there, it's, it's a, there's tons and tons of buildings and homes and stuff on the, on the historical, uh, historical charts. And they give you know, the, the, the background behind these different places. Well, there's a church over there, a Lutheran church. And they built this church. It's just as plain as day that they were taking their theology and they were applying it to architecture. The whole church is an upside-down boat. Okay? The whole church has this look of a boat that's turned upside down with the roof going up to a point on both sides and coming all the way down, pretty much all the way down to ground level. And it, it's, it's oblong. It's sort of a rectangle with curved edges. And it's an upside-down boat. Why did they do that? Well, they did that because Lutherans believed that the church was the ship through which you travel from this life to the next. We've got it. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't work with preterism. The archaeology doesn't, architecture doesn't work. The theology doesn't work. It, none of it works. So we've got to rethink congregational life in terms of covenant context. Here's another one. How about this for a session title? Garden Life versus Wilderness Wandering, Marriage and Family in Covenant Context. Because how do, how do Christians raise their kids today? They raise their kids as if they were wandering through the wilderness, just passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And they raise their kids in that environment. I believe that's got to change. Um, When you understand that through the work of Christ, through the redemption that Christ brought about through his work of salvation, that you're living in God's garden, that is an entirely different perspective of the world around you, and that will have major implications on how you raise your children. I'll leave leave that at that that level. Here's number number three. Another presentation that uh, probably more controversial. How about this? The abiding covenant context of salvation and damnation. 
the end of universalism right and left. <laughs> yeah, that's the way Christian theology has done it, right? Salvation and damnation are always thought of in terms of a universal context. The whole physical universe. Everybody, every human being in the physical universe is either saved or damned. What about covenant context? Is salvation and damnation really being presented as a universal thing in Scripture? Or is there a covenant context to that? The end of universalism, right and left. Here's another one, the missions. Missions as kingdom expansion. We've talked, people, preterists have, have pointed out how missions has been done in terms of futurism for a long time. I think, I think preterists need to do that in terms of the original creation mandate. Missions as kingdom expansion. I, and I would argue that's from the very beginning. Here's another one that would probably be somewhat controversial. The Christian's relationship to governments as covenant worlds. Because if you read the Old Testament, what's the idolatry that's going on in the Old Testament? Generally, it has to do with a political dimension. And we don't tend to think of governments today as covenant worlds. I presented it that way last year at the conference with my maps. I presented covenant worlds in terms of you know, maps that depict a political, societal organization, a cosmos. Not material, but a cosmos nonetheless. And I think that the Christian's relationship to the state will be transformed by preterism, first of all, but also by covenant creation, because it gives us the tools to see the state as a covenant world. And once we start seeing it as a covenant world, as Christians, and as citizens of God's covenant world, the new heavens and new earth, it's going to have ramifications for how we interact with the claims of the of the of the um, of governments, with what governments are intending to do and how they operate. So, there are a lot of things here that covenant eschatology and covenant creation matched together can illuminate. And uh, I just want to leave it at that. So I, I thank you for listening. I thank you for your time as we do a brief introduction to what covenant creation is all about. And uh, we'll see how this goes and uh, the investigation goes for this weekend and also next weekend. And I'm looking forward to all the presentations uh, by the new speakers this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for uh, joining us here this morning. And uh, now, Tim, did you want to uh, open up the lines to take any questions if anybody wanted to call in? Absolutely. Okay, for anybody out there listening, if you have any questions about anything that Tim just mentioned, you are more than welcome to call in directly to 562-296-4040. Once again, that's 562-296-4040. Did you catch that, Tim, all those 40s in there? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> also, if you are listening over at ad70.net from one of our listening pages and you want to call in toll-free, you can use our Google Voice widget over on the right-hand side of the page. It says, Call Me. You just click on that. You type in your name and your phone number. You click Connect. And uh, Google Voice will connect both of our phones toll-free, where you can join in the conversation here and ask Tim any questions you might have. And, uh, you know, Tim, it's, it's very interesting, some of the conversation that was going on in the chat room uh, during your lecture here. And one of them, uh, in particular, was from... Uh, the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 7, as to, uh, you know, how how is the, the term Adam there to be interpreted? Is it supposed to be speaking about men in general, or is it speaking about Adam specifically? And, you know, again, the question was going back and forth. Well, you know, Strong's has all these different definitions mm -hmm. for the term Adam. Uh, was there a direct article before Adam? And if so, is there any kind of special exception where Ha-Adam could be translated simply Adam speaking about, uh, you know, Adam in the garden. Um, I'm going to defer on that question to, to Gerald Kratt because I think that's really the subject that he's going to be taking up at length in his presentation. Okay. Um, but uh, I think Gerald's done a lot more work on that particular issue than I have. So I'm going to sit back and, uh, you know, that, I'm going to sit back. I'm still mulling a lot of these over, a lot of these details over. And on that issue, I'm not, I'm not f really comfortable to comment on that, but I think Gerald has done the most work on that, and I look forward to his presentation on that subject. 
Okay. Um, now, also, I did take a few notes here, and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. When we as uh, preterists, those of us who understand this message of fulfillment uh, regarding the book of Revelation, Matthew chapter 24, and it, the end of Israel's old covenant age, you know, we, we it took a lot for us to, to step back from our 21st century uh, futuristic Zionistic mindset to put on a rabbi's sandals and walk in the first century and see and understand things the way that they did. And, you know, my question is when we are reading, you know, we know that the New Testament was written approximately 2,000 years ago, and there was a big difference in the language and the way things were spoken back then. But when we get all the way back to the book of Genesis, that was something that was, uh, you know, written some, or at least recorded some 4,000 years earlier, compiled by Moses, uh, you know, again, thousands of years after the, the the fact that it took place. And my question again is, you know, how much more do we need to be careful not to read our 21st century understanding of science and, uh, you know, biblical interpretation? We, we, we we're careful to do it with things that were written in the first century. How much more careful mm-hmm. do we have to be when we're going back 6,500 years ago? That's a leading question, and I think it's going to be very natural for preterists to start looking at Genesis as ancient Near East literature. And uh, that is a very good point because it is it, we are further removed from that even, Genesis specific, specifically, than we are from the New Testament. And we already know how much of a challenge it is to get you know, out of our conceptions, out of our definitions of words and thoughts and paradigms to understand the New Testament. And I just can't see how we we can deny that it's even more so going back to Genesis. But I do want to say that, um, you know, none of this would be possible for us if there wasn't a lot of archaeological research that is providing material from us for us from the Middle East, from the Mesopotamia area, from that general part of the world where civilizations go a long ways back into. And those finds are going to help us get a better picture of the ancient mindset. And so in a sense, you can say that the theology and the culture are really kind of related here. You know, people talk about sola scriptura all the time, but um, in a strict sense, there is no such thing because you have to understand what languages are and what the words mean in order to read scripture. Well, that takes extra, you know, there's no lexicon in the Bible other than the way the words are used themselves. Right. There's, there's not, there's not these definitions, you know, it's just not presented to us that way. We have to go and study the, 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 the contemporary culture to understand a lot of the illusions, a lot of the details that are, that are talked about in the New Testament. And now what's exciting about this is that um, even with with uh, discoveries, archaeological discoveries in the ancient world, we're finding a lot of things that need to be gone over by Christians, okay, mm-hmm. and need to be evaluated again within the context of Genesis because Genesis is very old writing. Right. Even if you take a Genesis or a Moses view, it's still very old. I believe it's older than that. But that's going to be a big help, and I don't think we should discourage that because – it, all it does is gives us more tools to to put to bring more understanding out of the scriptures and the way they thought, the context in which they lived, their mindset, their worldview, which is necessary. We already see that as necessary in the New Testament. Right. So it's kind of sad too because Christians have have run away from that kind of work because they they chalk it up to evolutionists doing their thing or whatever. But um, it's just we're just handicapping handicapping ourselves when we approach approach the issues that way there's going to be and this has only been the last two or three hundred years that that, uh europeans of european background and descent are now digging up these old towns these old cities and finding these old tablets this is this is a new this is a new development in the big scheme of things and we have no idea what they're going to find and you know sooner or later we're going to have to you know do kingdom work and going back and evaluating this stuff from a Christian perspective, which is very much needed to be done. So we've got a lot of work to do. Right, and uh, right. that's, that's where I, that's where I, it's bigger. It's big. This is all way bigger. I think than any of us can realize as far as the long-term future of the church in the kingdom of God here on earth. 
Right. And, and you know, I, I do see that we do take so many presuppositions from so much doctrine that we have learned uh, even before and probably concurrent with our, our walk in this fulfilled world and life view that really kind of determine and color the way we approach these passages. You know, whether, whether uh, Genesis was something that was written by Moses through the inspiration of God uh, or whether it was something that was, uh, you know, compiled and written down as histories or even oral tradition for thousands of years before Moses— uh, you know, the question, again, you have to deal with the fact that, you know, how, how was the, the language used, the heaven and earth? How did somebody that in Moses' day heard in the beginning God mm-hmm. created the heavens and the earth? Uh, and, and then even beyond that, if these things were something that were handed down by oral tradition or even written tradition, be it in chiseled in stone or whatever, uh, you know, how did they understand these terminologies? How were they used by Jesus and the the Holy Spirit inspired inspired uh, writers of the New Testament. You know how were they using the terms heavens and earth? Were they using the terms cosmologically or covenantally? Right, and that's where I think this is this is where the development of covenant creation is really gaining ground because what we did was we sort of worked through the apostles and seeing how they used heavens and earth going back to Genesis 1, okay? So we're using them as a rope that's pulling us back toward Genesis. Okay, Jeff Jeff and my work on Beyond Creation Science really kind of worked with eschatology and then sort of developed the implication backwards from there. Now we have people like John Walton doing just the reverse, okay? They are working on the original ancient literature uh, aspects in the ancient cultures, and they're working forward through the prophets and saying, "Wait, this is the way that this is the way all the Old Testament works." Right? Okay, they're going in the direction toward the New Testament, and that is a real good confirmation that we're onto something. We may have some things wrong. We we may need to tweak some things. I'm not set on on a lot of stuff about coming creation, but the fact that you have someone else working from a entirely different viewpoint, entirely different direction, and they're coming to the same conclusions. That is a good confirmation that we're going in the right direction. Right. Now, an- another thing that people might be bringing into the discussion is how did somebody like Josephus understand Genesis 1? Did he understand it as cosmological creation? Uh, did he... Uh, and, and I think that's a very fair question. And, yes. And, uh, but also, other... Uh, you know, Hebrew writers and thinkers from uh, the first century and even hundreds of years before that? That, that is a very fair question, and uh, I appreciate Josephus a great deal. Uh, but again, the, the issue is context there. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Josephus was a trained Pharisee. Okay, we already see in the New Testament how the Pharisees thought. And so he, I'm, I'm not so sure that he could have gotten out of his own conceptions about the physical material things. Josephus talks about the long lifespans also uh, in his in his book, uh, in his histories, regarding the patriarchs. They had long lifespans because they ate well. Hmm. They had food we don't have today. That's essentially what Josephus says. Wow. Now, you can think how that logic is Pharisee logic, right? Because it's all material. If you eat good food, you're going to live 800 years. <laughs> That's the way the Pharisees thought. So, again, I think one of the solutions is context there, and I don't think we need to overlook the fact that Josephus promised an entire treatise explaining what Genesis 1 means that he never delivered on. So That's right. That's right. We don't have actually all of Josephus' views, and he made a point to make a promise in his text that he was going to write another book explaining what Genesis – well, if you – well, think about it. If if he's going to write another book on Genesis one, it means a little bit. It's got to be a little bit big. His view is pretty big, isn't it? It's right. not just oh yeah, twenty four hour days. And that's where the whole world was made. You well, don't have to write a book to say that, <laughs> right? Well, I, I think honestly, if it was supposed to be understood as something cosmological and basically a regurgitation of the early chapters of Genesis, why in the world would he need to write something of a commentary to explain it further? Right. You know, and, and I think that is a very, very interesting point and a very interesting question. You know, fortunately for us, we are digging things up in the Middle East now, uh, you know, on a daily basis that are helping us better understand the culture of the first century. And, you know, even if you go back 100 years, we didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and now we do. 
it's amazing. And we still don't have some of the Dead Sea Scrolls out. Right. That's right. that's even more astonishing. It's locked up in various political institutions that feel embarrassed if they were to let things out with the nation of Israel. Right. So you don't have that. And and the other thing that's interesting thing too is that some of Josephus is being confirmed. I don't want to. I don't want to entirely uh, be negative on Josephus here because some of Josephus is being confirmed in this research as well. They found Herod's tomb recently, just in the last year or two, exactly where Josephus said it was. Hmm. And people for for decades have said, "No, Josephus is out to lunch. This is just him making stuff up." And lo and behold, there's Herod's tomb, exactly where he said it was. Nice. So there are good things too in that research. It's sort of. Uh, reinforcing that uh, you know we should probably pay attention to all this stuff a little more carefully, and not allow our modern you know we know it all you know, arrogance to uh, to over to to develop an overweening pride uh, in modern scholarship because it's just not it's just not helpful. That's cool. how you miss stuff. Right now, just real quick, uh, one thing you brought up you brought up John Noe's work uh, Beyond the End Times. Sure. And uh, you know I was actually this last week talking with John about covenant creation and his understanding of things and his approach is that it's a, a both and in that it is a covenantal creation but it, that it is also pointing to cosmological creation which is you know even something that i've said look you know i, I don't and i i'm pretty sure and you can correct me if i'm wrong you understand the genesis account as to have been something that was happening approximately yes. 6,500 years ago. And I'm using that number loosely, approximately 6,500 sure. years ago, as compared to some of the young earth, or I'm sorry, the old earth views that would push that back much further to right. to make it jive with science. But, uh, you know, John himself said, look, he goes, I, I think it's both. I do believe that it is, uh, a co you know, a, a covenantal creation account, but that it is also speaking to and about cosmological creation, which... You know, and I've brought this up recently on the station that, you know, when you look at, you know, even some of the other creation accounts from other ancient Near Eastern uh, societies, they were applying God's creation and, and the elements of creation to a pantheon of gods. Right. And so, you know, how much more would that uh, be, you know, kind of come into focus when we have the, the God of Israel saying, no, I'm the one that created all these things and I'm one God. Right. So just a couple more thoughts there. But uh, yeah, yeah. The, I definitely view the physical stuff being described there as being used for a purpose. I mean, they, it's not like it's not like a quote unquote entirely spiritual view of creation. It's talking about their experiences and they had experiences with, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars and gardens and trees and stuff like that. Um, it's using those for for other purposes that's the way i look at it so it's not like entirely removing the physical experience experiential aspect from it but my problem with with the both and approach is that are we going to be consistent with it because are we going to then say that the death in the garden is both and so that we have both physical death inaugurated and spiritual death or covenant death i think is a better term inaugurated and if you do that both and approach with that you don't you run into major problems because then you have both a, f a fulfillment and an unfulfillment that we're waiting for in terms of the defeat of the death. So how are we going – and the same thing with, with thorns and thistles in the, in the Genesis 3 pronouncement of judgment. Are we going to say thorns and thistles, physical thorns and thistles began there and, and something covenantally based, the way the prophets use thorns and thistles in re reference to covenant apostates? See – I want I want to understand, and maybe maybe this is the right way to go. But I would like to see some work done on how we can consistently take that as full preterists and apply a both and perspective, because I can't see how it's done. And certainly, pre full preterism is not arguing that we have a both and view of the death in the garden, right? And yet, how are we going to separate that out as something different? I mean, it's going to become real arbitrary, and it's going to not work. So that's what I'd like to see if if you know, I'm, I'm open to considering a both-and approach. I've looked at a couple of both-ands approaches, and and they just seem to fall apart to me because I'm not a partial preterist. Right. I'm a full preterist, and, and full preterism is based on the resurrection. The resurrection is not a physical, material 
resurrection. Right. You know, that's what bar- partial predators are arguing. It's both and. Well, that's what leads them into futurism, and I'm I'm not convinced of that at all. So, I'm open to look at it, but I need to see some work beyond just an as- bare assertion that I believe it's both and. Well, that's nice. Sort of like John Walton said in his book, you got to demonstrate that. You can't just assert it. It's got it's got to be more than that. Right. Well, you know. It- both and is definitely a safe way to go because then <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be a heretic. <laughs> right. It, it is definitely a safe middle ground, a lot like the partial preterist view. Uh, you know, they, they're having their cake and eating it too. <laughs> well, Tim, I, you know, I want to thank you for, for joining us here today. And uh, this has definitely been enlightening. And the discussion that uh, this has created in the chat room has been absolutely incredible to see. I'm really looking forward to uh, what's coming up next uh, in just about uh, 90 minutes time we're going to have norm voss joining us and his lecture is called first fruits christian understanding of second temple judaism temple literature uh, also then coming up at uh, 3 p.m pacific daylight time tim martin jeff vaughn and myself are going to be having a round table discussion on the uh, that's going to be replacing tim king timothy king's uh, lecture he was going to be doing on sin and righteousness as community issues. Um, and then coming up at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, Alan Bondar will be joining us with his lecture called The Image of God and the Nakedness of Man. Anything else as we wrap things up here today, Tim? No, I'm just looking forward to the to the, to the material, the new material that's going to be presented. I, I hate, I hope that this didn't disappoint anybody because I felt like I really had to start this conference off with a review of what covenant creation is all about because a lot of times the critics don't really understand what covenant creation is all about and we have new people coming in all the time as well so this is an introduction this is a basic overview review and uh, i look forward to the coming material that will will, i i sense will push covenant creation forward as far as a developed paradigm well you know and again this uh, the question always does come up you know where does this fit in young earth old earth and it's like guys it's neither it's neither. It's really not. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of looking at things that's saying, okay, you know what? Both the young earth and the old earth views are, are at least in some sense, missing the boat. Maybe I should have said missing the ark. <laughs> <laughs> but, have uh, a great day, Mike. All right, Tim. We will uh, see you back here in about uh, four and a half hours. God bless. AD70.net. Broadcasting live 24 hours a day. Music. Teaching and so much more.